uh, thank you very much, Eva, for the introduction. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. This is a, a good crowd of, of uh, people to talk to, and I think that, you know, I'm sort of looking, many of you seem to be young, enthusiastic people at the beginnings of a career in carbon markets, um, and I uh, applaud your choice of, of direction. Um, and I'd have to say that I think for all of the speakers um, approaching this, uh, you know, this set of discussions after Copenhagen has been a bit of a challenge because it is so easy to be feeling a little bit down. Um, and so I thought I would start acknowledging that and then hopefully by the end of the presentation we'll be feeling a little bit more uplifted. But, uh, um, I mean, it is easy to feel glum about the carbon market a bit. You know, the Copenhagen Accord, you know, the, I mean, the word accord itself gives us a suggestion of people coming together and signing something positive. And so, really, how much accord is there actually in the accord? Um, I don't need to go... For, you know, into this in detail, obviously, we've just had a long presentation around this. Um, but essentially, you know, with weak and non-binding targets, unclear legal status, um, virtually all the effort of the Bali Action Plan uh, caught up in what are called L documents. These are the sort of the final um, documents that are normally brought to a final plenary and accepted in the negotiations, and there's a whole series of L documents. Um, and they're still full of square brackets. They weren't really worked on in the last few days. Um, and so that's where all that hard work is, and it's unclear what's, what's going ahead with that. Excuse me, I just might get some water. <coughs> We've heard about, you know, the faltering of domestic emissions trading schemes. You know, you know the US cap-and-trade bill may, may not go ahead in 2010. There's high political drama in Australia. Um, and compliance, you know, the compliance demand has been weakened by, you know, by the recession. So all of these are kind of down news, down stories. But I would like you to step back from that sort of, you know, negative, you know, perspective of, or, or outlook and really think about what is the ultimate driver for carbon markets. Now, I'd like to keep using the word, pl the, the plural, carbon markets, not just carbon market. And I think I'm doing that deliberately because, um, you know, we need to think more broadly than just, you know, the compliance market or even the compliance markets because there are a few. So, uh, you know, let's, let's keep thinking about it broadly. And as I say, the ultimate driver for these is not really what governments do or don't do when you think of it more broadly. I mean, the ultimate driver is, is climate change and how carbon markets can influence the levels of investment that are needed to deal with it. So start to look at it a little bit more through the lens of investment. And in terms of some big-picture context, um, you know, and it's important, I think, that key heads of state did agree on some of this big picture, or at least the two-degree C version of the big picture, um, and that it's that global emissions need to peak within two decades or even faster, really, within a decade, um, be halved by 2050, um, bringing a global average per capita emissions down to about two tonnes CO2 per person. This is uh, work that Lord Stern has done. And essentially massive global reductions are needed in just four decades. I've done quite a lot of work in this last year around uh, the whole question of investments, because I think this is a positive way to look at, at, at you know, what we have to do. And in particular, the latest World Energy Outlook from the IEA, so the 2009 version of that, has got some very interesting material in it, and I've just clipped a few pictures out of that in the, in the next few slides. Um, it's quite useful, I think, that the IEA has chosen to use the word revolution. The IEA is actually quite a conservative organisation. Um, it's, it's a body of, of, you know, where they have to get government agreement to their language that they use. So whenever somebody goes out and says, we need a revolution, I think it's actually quite important, or well, particularly when the IEA says it. And they use this particular slide um, to explain why they've used the word revolution. And I just want to make one point. This... Uh, this axis here is, is a log axis. So this is 
this is sort of GDP going back in time and going forward in time. Um, and so they're looking at GDP, you know, going into very large levels. I mean, here it is, if it's about 100 trillion now, it could be 1,000 trillion and 10,000 trillion in the future. But the actual emissions have got to drop down to these kind of levels, even as GDP goes up enormously. And so it's that cliff face that's necessary, that that is how they chose to say we need a revolution. Something dramatic has to happen. And in their document, they do quite a lot of work around investments um, in terms of actually starting to put numbers to it now. Um, this slide here isn't really yet in investment terms, but it's, it's basically, in, and again, just to note, this is around energy emissions. It's not all greenhouse gas emissions. But essentially, in their, their reference scenario, emissions that just keep going up, 20.9, 28.8, um, 34.5, and 2020, 40.2, and 2030. Those are emissions in the energy sector. And what they're saying is, if you're to be on a 2 degree C uh, or well, what they call their 450 ppm pathway, they have the scenario, they already need to have turned down by 2020. Um, they can be slightly higher than current, you know, than they were in, in, in uh, 2007, but they're turning down, so 30.7 in 2020, 26.4 in 2030, and that's sort of on the way to, you know, reductions down here. So they've, they've modelled this out, and you get that sense. And then they've talked about the scale of investments that's necessary. Um, and this is the 450 part per million scenario, so this is their, their green scenario. And this is power generation, so this isn't all energy. But to give you a sense, here's investments over the next 10 years, 2010 to 2020. So a total of $3, 3 trillion of investment is, is in their 450 ppm scenario of which 71% is an essentially um, non-fossil fuel, or non-fossil fuel. So the stuff that's not in the 71%, this bit up here, is fossil fuels without CCS, so just kind of regular fossil fuels. So 71% of investments that are needed to, to get to be on that 450 ppm scenario in the next 10 years need to essentially be you know, low carbon or, or zero carbon. Um, and then in the, in the next decade, 91% of $5 trillion needs to be. So these are very large numbers of investments that are necessary. And they plot this out in, um, in a whole series of graphs. Um, they've got, this is the global graph, but they've got these graphs also for many countries or, or country regions. Um, and the useful thing here, this is so, I'm trying to, to focus on and the demand side. So it's not just supply side investments. And so, for example, in 2020, in their, in their green scenario, their 450 ppm scenario, um, 2,517 million tonnes of CO2 of abatement comes from the demand side, comes from efficiency, uh, not supply side. And that's that's two-thirds. So they're saying two-thirds of the abatement comes from the demand side, um, one-third from supply side. And when it comes out into 20, you know, 30, it's about um, 60%. So here's 7,880 million tonnes of CO2 abatement coming from the demand side. And then they've got... I mean, these figures are an, are an incremental investment, the extra investment. So here's... In, in 2010 to 2020, two trillion dollars worth of investment in, in energy efficiency, um, for example, and then they've got the numbers for renewables and other things. So again, it's, it's, give, it's giving a very good sense about you know where the investments are necessary, and so this is part of you know what, you know as a as a group of professionals thinking about climate change and in, in, in the private sector, these are where the opportunities are uh, we need to think about. Um, in and they go through a whole series of countries. I've picked China just because it's always interesting to pick China um, and to give a sense of the scale that's going on in China. So again, you know, here's you know, 3,000 uh, million tonnes of abatement in, in, uh, in the efficiency side and 266 
billion dollars of investment that ne that's necessary. So again, they've got all, the, you know, this is all plotted out. And I'm leading to this next one here. This is a plot just in power generation. So this now is supply side in China. And it gives you a sense that the blue bars are tw uh, out to 2020. So by 2020, this is, the this is the scale of the supply. So this is, so for example, wind this is about 150. And these are gigawatts. So there'll be 150 gigawatts of wind, um, you know, hydro and other things. And again, this is, this is their model in their clean, their 450 ppm scenario. This is not the business as usual scenario. This is this revolutionary scenario. Um, and then one has to think, you know, what is, what is a gigawatt? What does that mean? Um, there was work done some years ago by Sokolow and Pakalo, and they were called the Wedges, and, and they helped climate change policy think about and practice what was it going to take. Um, and, and this is a little bit similar. So, for example, in China there was 170 gigawatts of wind and other renewables by 2020, and there was 30 gigawatts in India. Um, and what does it take to get a gigawatt? So, for example, I know that technologies that, that Spain is very forward on, which are solar technologies, um, to get a gigawatt, if you had 50 megawatt plants, which are big solar plants if you don't have thermal storage, you'd need 20 of those per gigawatt. And solar with thermal storage, storage which are much smaller at the moment, you'd need you know, nearly 70 plants per gigawatt times you know, 170 or 30. So this gives you a sense of the scale of these new investments, these new plants, that at the moment are happening in ones and twos and they tend to be at the pilot level. So, and just finally coming back to sort of set the challenge, this notion of, of getting down to 2050 to this two tonnes per person. And just to give you a sense of here's a whole series of countries, where are they now in terms of emissions? Um, so we were just talking about Canada. You know, Canada's at 23 per person, heading towards 29 by 2050, and so that's a long way from two. But even China is six, heading towards 19, which is a long way from two. And the point that Lord Stern made when he, when he released this, this way of thinking about it was, if there's any large economies that are higher than two, there have to be equally large economies that are lower than two. So who are they going to be? I mean, even India is about two now, but that's heading towards six. So this notion that there, that, you know, there can be some economies, however, can still be very much higher at that per capita level has to be sort of rationalised against, well, OK, who, who's going to be very much lower? And you can't just say, well, it's going to be India or Africa, because they're not, they're not, you know, either they're heading higher or they're not big enough to counteract that. So again, the, you know, this all gives a sense of this revolution that's necessary. But, the, but I think the, the key point of, of this, these challenge slides, as I call them at the beginning of the talk, in a talk about carbon markets, is that you, you need to ask the sort of the strategic question, how can carbon markets influence the change from business as usual investments needed? And do it better than other interventions you know, that can change business as usual. You know, what's the role for carbon markets? Um, and so that's a sort of, I sort of leave that as a standing question and, and, and sort of how are we doing? So you know, some assessment of, of how we are doing is, well, how far have we come? And, and I'd first quickly like to go through just some sort of some history and some founding theory a little bit because it's easy to forget what was the purpose in the first place. So maybe just go back to that. Um, just all very quickly, carbon trading, international carbon trading, started with the Kyoto Protocol mechanisms, and there were three. There was Article 17, which was international emissions trading, Article 6, which was joint implementation, and Article 12, the CDM. But the actual model was the USSO2 trading scheme. Um, and, uh, and essentially the innovations were JI and CDM because they introduced this notion of offsets, um, but essentially they relied on the demand of international emissions trading to happen, initially anyway. This is before the EU ETS. So this was, the, this was how it sort of got started. And it was a very simple point that, that needed to get sold to, to you know, the decision makers around the role of international emissions trading. 
Um, and it's very simply that if you have uh, two emitters um, and they both have to take deep reductions, but for one emitter it's extremely costly and for the other emitter it's not as costly, if you allow trading, the lower cost emitter can overcomply and can sell its overcompliance to the high cost emitter and so the overall costs are lower. And this is the single fundamental point of emissions trading. It was intended to provide a means to achieve collective commitments at lower cost. And the, and the reason for wanting to do that, apart from lower cost being obviously a good thing and governments and politicians like lower cost, is the fact, so the environmental point of that, it's not just an economic point, is that if you can achieve the first round of reductions at reasonable cost, you will be less sort of scared off taking deeper reductions in the future. So always achieving things at lower cost is a good thing to do. And this is just a simple version, same thing. You know, you establish a collective cap, which is the, the outside circle, um, and then you can have, you've got your two emitters, and one over complies and one under complies and one sells its surplus to the other. But they sit within an overall cap so that's how it sort of turns into, and, and think of these as countries at this stage. And then, you know, just the same picture again, here's the collective cap. Um, if you hadn't had that, if you'd had unconstrained emissions, it would have been the big circle. And inside that you have a series of emitters, you know, the green ones are the ones that over-comply, the red ones under-comply, and they trade. And I mean, that's, that was the sort of the conceptual underpinnings of international emissions trading. And then there were two things that sort of sort of added to that, um, I'll not mention JI because that, that sort of is a bit more complex, but essentially um, land use, land use change in forestry added additional allowances into the system. Um, and this is the land use, land use change in forestry occurring inside the developed countries that were inside the cap. So, so those, that sector was not part of the cap, but it added, it added some extra, sorry, LULUCF added extra um, units um, and the CDM did the same thing. So you just added up the, the allowances, the allowed emissions by, by those two things, Lulu CF and CDM. Um, so again, that's our basic model. Um, the mechanics is then that you take the entire collective caps, you turn them into individual units, um, you issue them as allowed, they are essentially allowed emissions. At the country level, those are grandparented to countries, so countries didn't have to have to purchase their their allowances, their AAUs. They they would just issue them themselves based on their on their agreement, um, and that's how you get it into units. Each unit is serialised. Um, you pop all of that into registry systems that keep track of every unit, and now you've got the you know the basics of a trading scheme. And um, and when it comes to compliance, you know, countries have to retire the number of units that equal their emissions, and that's how they comply. And so that's the, the legal structural system by which, by which this all works. And, and so, you know, this was the whole design of Article 17. Article, um, it had the Lulu CF rules as well. It had the whole registry designs. This is all in the Marrakesh Accords, describes all of this stuff. Um, and it actually took talking through how registries work for many countries to actually understand the concept of how it would work at the end of the day. Now, what I haven't gone into, this is the mechanics at the trading level. I haven't, sorry, at the, at the sort of international compliance level. I've not gone into, obviously, all of the, the market that then comes around this and the role of the, you know, the, the financial institutions and the lawyers and everybody who actually get, get part of the trading. Um, but that's just all... You know, come in behind once you have the system in place. And then when you get down to um, the domestic implementation of it, um, again, as I draw this in circles, so again, if this is the big collective cap, the outside circle, and you've got a, a series of countries, all of which have binding targets, um, and inside a particular country, then the rules said countries can allow their entities to do it. So we had, that was the single important rule in the Marrakesh Accord and the Kyoto Protocol, that this wasn't just government to government trading, it could involve entities. So 
in almost one sentence, it opened up essentially what's happened in terms of trading at the entity level, um, and you know that gave the right for countries to, to have their own domestic emissions trading schemes where they would set up the same thing at a domestic level, and this is what enabled the EU ETS. Um, and so they're kind of you know the the second order. Um, you know, perch, uh, um, you know, countries with the obligations. Uh, sorry, entities with the obligations. So. And the importance of having domestic emissions trading schemes was fundamentally that it's firms and businesses who know what their mitigation opportunities and costs are. You didn't want to set up this thing just to have government, to, you know, government to government trading, because in fact governments don't have any sense necessarily of what individual firms' costs are. And if this is about lowering costs and if it's about setting up structures where the decision should should I abate further at higher cost or should I buy, that decision should be placed as close to the ground as possible where business decisions are made. So it was always intended to go domestic, you know, and and to the entities. That was the fundamental principle. Always, you know, right from the word go. Anyway, so that's the theory. That was the theory anyway. Um and now let's think a little bit about what's happened in practice. Uh, the architects of Kyoto expected relatively open links between the international scheme and the domestic schemes and a fungible carbon commodity. I mean, that's what we had in mind. And when I say we, uh, you know, I, I was in the room that, that, that helped write the rules. I chaired the, the drafting group that wrote the, you know, many of these rules. Um, this was our sort of conceptualisation. Now, it mostly hasn't worked out that way, Instead, different countries, as they've approached doing a mis you know, domestic schemes, have decided to have their own you know, commodities and their own sort of sets of rules and, and sort of build walls around their schemes. Um, and one can say, well, that started with the EU and let's blame them for that. Um, but to be fair to the EU, um, they sort of had to do it. And the reason was when the, when the US didn't ratify Kyoto, that completely changed the supply-demand balance that was considered in Kyoto. And in particular, it meant that um, there was a huge, you know, t almost technical surplus there uh, with, the, with the Russian hot air or with the, and, and with other countries' hot air. And so the whole um, supply-demand balance was upset so considerably that the EU actually had to create a wall and say, well, we don't want that stuff in, in our system and if they hadn't done that, there would have been you know, oversupply and no value. So to create value for carbon, they had to create the wall. So you know, we ended up with the EU ETS. It's got um, and then when you think about other schemes, so let's say if there is to be an Australian scheme, in some ways the CDM creates a bridge across the schemes. So it means that the Australians could, could buy from the CDM market and the EU, EUS can buy from the CDM market. And so you know, what's happening here in terms of supply and the prices tends to sort of create a bit of a, a price barrier, um, so, sorry, a price bridge between the different schemes. And so that's kind of how the system is starting to evolve, and in fact Anthony sort of pointed out to that, um, that that's how it can evolve as it goes forward. If you had a more open international market, you'd have lots of doors and windows. That's all that picture's trying to say. Excuse me for going quickly, but I've had a somewhat limited time. Where you would like to end up uh, is essentially a whole series of emissions trading schemes, or with relatively open doors and windows, and a, and a sort of a common currency that can sort of flow through. Um, that, that, that's what would be ideal. Uh, this has got lots of words on it, and I'll not go into them in too, in too much detail. I, I did this a couple of years ago. It was a sort of a picture of what could a, f a future framework you know, look like, and it had uh, a quantitative side and, and another side that had a whole bunch of policies and measures and various other things in the agreement and financing and enabling environments and adaptation, etc. But on the quantitative side, which would be the side that would set the basis for a global carbon market, Again, you know, the notion, OK, we'll still have some un unconstrained emissions as the big circle. We'll constrain that with fixed and binding targets in, in, in industrialised countries. There's a question whether international bunker fuels would actually be part of that constraint and that legal system, or they would sit somehow over on this other side, sort of in the outside system. And the same was true for red. Is red going to be part of the quantitative 
agreement and, and, or is it, is it going to be over here? And we introduced this new idea that there could be these sector no-lose targets for developing countries could be a new sort of quantitative circle. Um, and on this side, then, that would have been, um, you know, sort of set that structure for the international scheme and include a, a new mechanism, an expanded mechanism for, for developing countries, which would have been intensity-based sectoral targets for some key sectors and some key countries was, was the notion. And all of these things sit inside those L documents and the text still. The ideas are still there but, but never got through. Now, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about looming risks for compliance-driven carbon markets, um, and, and hence why there's some sort of gloom on that side. And it's mostly on the demand side of the market is where the, the problems are. And one way to capture this is, I found which is useful, is, is a, there's an, an organisation called IASA in Austria, and they're the people who have the gains model and... Um, and you can find them on the website. And this is, a, this is a slide from one of their presentations. And what they were trying to do, this, they did this in um, Barcelona, at the Barcelona meeting just before Copenhagen. And they were trying to sort of send out a message, listen, given the recession and given the, what were then the pledges in terms of what countries were prepared to do in 2020, you know, our modelling would suggest that, that, that there's a real problem. And and this, this slide here is the, the marginal abatement cost curve. So this is, these are the marginal abatement costs of all of the Annex 1 countries, including their pledges. And so all this is trying to say is, is the, the, um, the blue line, these are the abatement cost curve going up, is the blue line. And then the red line is the same thing. And the difference is the blue line was based on the IEA's World Energy Outlook reference case in 2008 and the red line is based on 2009 when in fact you know, the, the, uh, the emissions have come way down and so the, the, what they were trying to say is that and with the current pledges um, now with the, with the lower reference scenario in fact um, there's not even a um, uh, there would not even be a, a, a demand. There would be no price to carbon. The marginal, the marginal price would be negative um, or, was, would, or zero, would be down here somewhere. And uh, if the, um, uh, with the higher pledges, that's what the two lines are. It just took me a while just to remember that. The, the, you know, this is the higher um, uh, line so there, with the, there would actually be a price. So, okay, uh, that was a bit confusing. So, what I'm saying is that the, um, with the current pledges, the, there would not be a price um, with the... Uh, this is actually a different... I'm thinking, I'm mixing my, in my head two different slides... Their story. So let's forget the slide a little bit because it's confusing. The story is, is much simpler. The story was simply that at the, at the pledge level, there was unlikely to be a price for the simple reason that um, the pledges you know, were not strong enough given the much lowered emissions that have occurred because of the recession. And so that, again, was a very gloomy news, was sort of pointing out you know, you need to have higher pledges to to actually get a price, um, not these low, pre, you know, low pledges. You know, pledges. Uh, you know, was was the key message. I'll move on. Now, it's true that we can't base policy just insights on just one set of model results, but it it kind of makes sense if you have weak targets and slower economies. And you're carrying over surpluses from CP1, so that's the whole story about what happens with the, you know, the hot air surpluses. You're going to have very little demand, and very little demand means, um, you know, either no price, 
or it means that people who are trying to maintain a price such as the EU you know, e ETS, they will have to have more and more constraints about what, what supply they're allowing. So they, and you're starting to see this. You know, the EU said, well, you know, we don't want you know, regular CDM anymore. We, don't, we might allow this other stuff. So it just means that the, the compliance markets are, in, are kind of in trouble if we only have weak targets. Um, it's going to be hard to actually maintain a significant price at the same time as having these new mechanisms and new credits coming in from, from developing countries. And apart from that whole issue of the EU ETS, um, which, as I say, may have limited demand and, and there'll be new prices, you know, what other compliance demand will exist? You know, will an international emissions trading mechanism survive? You know, you know, so will there be sovereign demand, um, not just entity demand? Will domestic emissions trading schemes actually happen in the US, Canada, Japan, Australia to create the demand? So these are all of the kind of gloomy news. It's mostly demand side. There's no problem of people dreaming up ideas to have enhanced mechanisms on the supply side. And, and a lot of the thinking about, about sector no-lose targets, a lot of that is done. You know, we sort of know what the challenges are, but we know how it could, how it could work. But that's all about having a lot more supply. And, and if you don't have demand, that's just not a helpful thing to be thinking about. So it's the demand side that's the concern in the compliance markets. So we're back to feeling pretty gloomy and perplexed. So where to now? And, and I think that the, the, the issue then becomes how can carbon markets influence the change? It comes back to this. How can they influence the change from business as usual better than other interventions across this whole investment spectrum? on the demand side as well as the demand, energy demand now, you know, like energy efficiency as well as the supply side. And from my perspective, when you go back to that first part of the presentation, which was pointing out, you know, the, the hundreds and thousands of wind farms and solar farms and all of these things that need to get the huge investment in energy efficiency, if that's the actual driver, those investments that are needed are seen as the driver, you then have to say, well, how do carbon markets fit into this? How can... How can we do something that's better than anybody else? You know, how can we prove the value of carbon markets in that? And, and so, to me, that's a cause for optimism because there's an opportunity for innovation and I think carbon, you know, you know, the finance industry and people in the carbon finance game have proven to be innovative. So let's, let's be optimistic about that. There's no doubt we need every sector and every tool in the policy toolkit and carbon markets can play a fundamental role around not just that theory of reducing costs, but it's also the fact that they engage people from the bottom up. And that is a huge um, and important attribute of carbon markets, generally. They're not just top-down sort of regulations. You know, the more you can engage people from the bottom up, the more gets done. The more intermediaries get involved, the more gets done. Um, and so carbon markets can be created by a range of different policy tools. We don't just have to think about cap and trade. There are sort of essentially offset models. There's contestable carbon funds. All of those can play a role. And we just have to think about markets in general. You know, markets exist where somebody needs a product or a service. Somebody else can create the product or service. And intermediaries exist to connect the two together. So that's just, that's all markets. Um, and so there can actually be many carbon markets depending on different programs of demand and supply. And these markets may connect, they may not. And who might some of the market demand? I mean, you need the market demand side somebody's be. Well, they can be sub-national levels of government. States and provinces may enact domestic emissions trading schemes in their regions and perhaps connect these with others. And we've heard about that exactly in the discussions of what's happening in the US, in different, as well as even US across into Canada with the Western, with the WCI program. So all of this is actually happening. People are talking about it, and in the absence of, of national schemes ever running, this stuff is ready to come in and fill some gaps. Um, and it doesn't just have to be in developed countries either. So there's a whole potential series of compliance type markets by different levels of government and, and in different countries that actually can play a role. Then there's a, a, another 
whole suite, and I think yesterday you heard a fair bit about the voluntary carbon market, so this is often perceived in a voluntary sense. Um, my personal view is that we need to stop thinking about it in a binary way and thinking, well, there's compliance markets and there's voluntary markets. I think we just have to think there are markets. Some of them will be driven by different types of sort of compliance drivers. Some of them won't be, and not sort of necessarily in a way, you know, have them as plan A and plan B or, you know, um, or somewhat stigmatise almost the voluntary space and say, oh, that's just while we're waiting to get to the compliance space. I, I think that's the wrong way to think about the growth of carbon markets. So you've got carbon neutral or low carbon footprint programs that have trading and offset mechanisms. And those too can come more perhaps from local governments, from city governments, from community groups who can be the drivers of those. And then you've got corporates who are certainly drivers. You've got citizens groups, you've got individuals. So in fact this whole notion of bottom-up effort um, fits very well with that, with that sort of second major bullet point. Um, and there's issues about supply chain. You know, we've kind of realised that that in fact Western governments seem to have very little leverage over China. China will do what it's going to do to a large extent. Um, but Western consumers and the growth, you know, the economic growth in China that Western consumption actually, you know, um, causes and which is important to China, they actually have some leverage, but probably not as, as you and I in the room as the ultimate consumer, um, but more... The, the corporates like the Walmarts, the Tescos, you'll have equivalents in, in Spain, you know, the, the major importer level who then have a supply chain, much of which can come from China and comes from India and comes from developing countries, you know, in, engaging them and that supply chain um, pressure around, first of all, measuring carbon footprints and then lowering carbon footprints, that can all have a carbon market, you know, play um, and, and can sort of build up carbon markets there. Another one I'd like to mention, just to sort of throw out, again, I don't know how you would call this, I don't think it's voluntary, it's not compliance in the regular sense, but a bunker's carbon fund. You may be familiar with the fact that in the negotiations, international aviation emissions and marine emissions were left out of Kyoto and there's been a highly contentious debate about should they be brought into the emissions trading schemes and brought in under that, that kind of quantitative compliance bubble somehow. And there's, and, and there's been a lot of debates around that and there's been a lot of talk about using them in some ways as a bit of a cash cow because they're outside. Well, let's, let's tax them and get lots of revenue from them to help pay for adaptation. That's been another favourite idea. Um, and so there's, in both the organisations that run international aviation and international marine, they are specialised UN agencies. One's ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organisation, and the other is the IMO, the International Marine Organization. They, in this year, both have major policy development programs with governments. They are inter intergovernmental bodies as well, talking about uh, the role of what they call market-based instruments to help um, control emissions in their sectors. So they're trying to come up with global agreements within their sort of UN processes with the view of, of stopping this UNFCCC process trying to come in and make decisions for them. And they are the same country, so it's, you know, it's, it's a question of which body do they do it in. And, um, and they want global outcomes. They don't want, in fact, and they want global agreements that would mean, for example, that the EU ETS would drop its idea of bringing international aviation into, into the EU ETS. Um, they could still have intra-EU, um, but, but not international. So they're looking for global schemes, and one of the ideas that's, that's bubbling away and, and, and seems to be heading somewhere is the idea that they would, they would self-levy um, or they would impose levies within their sector um, and, th and that would raise money and the money would go into three different pots the first pot would be a, a, a pot that would go to adaptation so it would be sent off to the UNFCCC adaptation fund and it would be them saying, yes, we recognise that there is a contribution from our sector to climate change and proportionate to our contribution, it's not unreasonable that some money should go from us to adaptation. And, you know, rather than the 20 or $30 billion a year that people have in mind in terms of you know, them being a big cash cow, um, it would be something smaller. But that would be one of the pots. The second pot would be um, cost-effective mitigation inside the sector and it would have quite a lot of 
technology transfer and capacity building across the developing countries in their sector. And the third pot's the interesting one. The third pot would be a commitment to a certain percentage of offsets. This, of course, would be a negotiable number. Um, they'd have to get agreement to it. But it's not unreasonable to start thinking it could be a number like 10 or 20 percent offsets. Um, and so because they have separately talked about having carbon neutral growth, you know, there's been different ways both sectors have talked about how they're trying to lower their emissions, so maybe it's by a progressive offsets that they can sort of essentially achieve um, uh, um, lowering their emissions as a sector in general if they, if they offset. Now, what do they do with all of that money? Well, <coughs> neither ICAO nor IMO are in the business of running, you know, carbon projects so, that, so one thing they could do is to go to somebody like the World Bank's Carbon Partnership Facility and say, you know, here, we will be giving you whatever, pick a number, five billion a year, um, and we are instructing you to purchase, you know, with that money, uh, X, um, you know, number of tonnes of carbon offsets, um, and we would like you, this is, this is an idea, uh, I'm a strategic advisor to ICAO, so I've got a few ideas floating around, so one idea I've suggested is what they should do is rather than connect up to compliance carbon, you know, don't connect to EUAs or CERs or anything like that. Go after carbon that, in fact, the compliance markets have had trouble sort of um, you know, creating a market demand for. So go after energy efficiency in buildings and, and transport sector and go after project scale red and <coughs> focus on those in developing countries and that tends to be the lower end of the cost curve and it would sort of fill a market need where people who are trying to do the supply in those markets are having trouble because there's not a compliance market that's really buying much of that. So this actually could be a, a large new driver. So these are some new ideas that you can think of in terms of creating carbon markets. And yes, there can be potential con you know, overlaps and conflicts between the markets and they do need to be addressed but we need to not sort of miss the forest for the trees. And what I mean here is there's a, there's a, you know, there can be a tendency that people get so hung up over possible conflicts and whether this represents double counting or whatever and, in fact, can get their logic wrong that, you know, you can kind of bury these ideas before they ever sort of get going because of sort of, you know, focusing way too much on the detail. There, there needs to, if, if, we're, if we're in a revolution... We need to be thinking much more revolutionary rather than worrying. So, you know, climate change is no longer an incremental or, a, or an evolutionary game. It's revolutionary. And so we need to think about how we can be revolutionary and what the role for carbon markets is. Um, and with lots of bright people and lots of young bright people coming into this, um, I think there's every reason to think we can be revolutionary. So thank you. Um, that's my details if you want further contact. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mara. I think you, you uh, cheered us up a little bit while talking about so many challenges, some of them pretty scary, I might say. Um, so your turn again. Does the audience have any questions? There's one question there. Well, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for your presentation. It was really, really interesting for me. Uh, I got just one simple question related to what you presented before. Uh, you said that one of the uh, weak points of the present carbon situation is the, the, well, the demand is not so high or as high as it was expected to be. And you, are, you have just said that one of the um, possible actions we can take is uh, reinforce the voluntary market, so the voluntary actions, and so uh, um, corporates and citizens and individuals can, you know, get involved on in everything and that. Uh, but on the other hand, and I'm not trying to play the devil's advocate here, yesterday we saw some numbers saying that, that right nowadays the um, voluntary market pre it represents about 2% of the present carbon market. Um, only, I think that the number was only about 10% of the uh, total amount of voluntary carbon uh, certificates of were being issued. 
uh, only 10% are, are being retired by now. So in my opinion, what, what it's supporting that market, it's just speculation. I mean, in my opinion, investors are just investing money as expecting if, I mean, someone is, in a, well, in a moment, those um, voluntary credits become equivalent to uh, regulated uh, Certificates. I don't know if you understand what I mean. So, in the end, I don't see how uh, nowadays the voluntary market can really become an alternative to 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 what you were saying. Thank you. Okay. Um, first of all, I think that it's um, one of the problems with the voluntary market is that it's always. <coughs> somewhat sat under a cloud of an attitude from, from government regulators that either it's you don't need it at all, um, it's something that needs to be regulated to protect citizens from carbon cowboys. Um, so there's actually been very little endorsement of the role of voluntary action. And um, so, you know, governments by and large um, haven't helped... They haven't created um, supportive, um, um, whether it's policies or, or um, there's been no support really from governments for the voluntary market. It's been driven from the from the bottom, from the voluntary end, almost against you know government's you know interests. And 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 a classic example has been, and this has been a serious problem, um, has been in the early stages when Defra put out the UK government put out some guidelines. It was very much about protecting British consumers from bad practice. And, and those guidelines came up with this notion of double counting and this notion of needing to cancel compliance units and it being credibility problems. So they, they came up with this all as part of this package of protecting the consumer. They weren't really thinking necessarily the logic of what they were doing very well. Um, but that created an environment um, which was quite negative and... and as the leaders of the voluntary market started to try to come out of that and, and they worked towards developing the voluntary carbon standard, again, they kind of recognised that they were coming... I mean, maybe it's, it's the same Fiona in, in the Financial Times, but there were certainly, you know, stories about crooks and cowboys, so that the environment was very negative. And so they also have been very conservative and they've kind of taken on this double-counting concept into the standard. Um, so that means, for example, that you can't do an energy efficiency programme in in Madrid, within the voluntary space, for example, to provide offsets to maybe a, a, a Spanish-based bank that wants to go carbon neutral, you can't do the projects in Spain um, and have, ish, have units issued under the voluntary carbon standard because it, it can, contravenes a double counting rule that they have in it. You would be forced to you know, have the projects that are producing those units be done in fact, outside, I mean, essentially in developing countries, outside Kyoto countries. Um, so there's been lots of inherent barriers and a sort of a, a, uh, an attitude that the voluntary market is a very much a secondary thing. Um, so I think if, you, if you're seeing it differently, if, if you're seeing we need to engage um, individuals in our countries in energy efficiency programs in every way possible and give them tools and easy things to do, there has to actually be a bit of a change about the attitude. And if, if, so first of all, if governments would start to see the benefit of engaging their citizens and supporting their, their proactive corporates as much as can be done, um, that would help. Um, if the voluntary carbon standard then sort of recognises that there's that sort of change you know, going and they, and they you know, forget about this double counting rule, which we could have a long discussion about, but which there's an there's a illogical base to the rule in the first place. So if that can be got past, then all of a sudden you've got the, the, the bases to actually be much more creative. Now, yesterday I saw on the website there was something to do with an Andalusian program to do with offsets, and I haven't had the time to look at it, but from the headline it made me wonder, maybe this is a, a, an innovative idea. Um, it sounded as if it was in sectors that weren't covered by the EU ETS, but I would have to read it more deeply to see if it was sectors not covered under Kyoto, because there's not many sectors not covered under Kyoto, because 
in some ways that looked as if it could be the beginnings of people being creative and not worrying about this notion of double counting, at least at the, at the full you know, Kyoto level. Um, and so I think that there, if we had an attitude that actually supported the notion of more um, active carbon neutrality and carbon foot, you know, footprint programs as a means to engage our citizens and aggregate things and get our ESCOs more active. In fact, there could be quite a lot of demand um, created in, in, um, you know, for projects in developed countries. At, at the moment, the projects all have to pretty much happen in developing countries, and that is a barrier. Um, and, and so I think that there's ways of, of uh, developed countries... The, one of the reasons that I wanted to, to, sh to you know, bring out the, the, um, the whole energy efficiency um, issue is the IEA, in their 450 ppm scenario, has huge abatement in energy efficiency. And you really have to ask the question, why is that going to happen? You know, we've had... Because a lot of that is in IEA countries. And we've had 20, 30 years of, of different policy attempts to get large amounts of energy efficiency that by and large have, um, you know, had rather mediocre outcomes. So there needs to be a game changer in energy efficiency. And my own view is that one thing we are not really doing in, in our own countries in energy efficiency is really using the carbon market at, at, at the bottom up level. And, and I think that that's something that we should be trying. So, More questions? Okay, I, I would have one question that can be answered either by Anthony or by Murray, as you want. Um, as Anthony has said, um, from now on, the majority of the, of the investment should come from the private sector. But no, no binding commitments have been, have been established after Copenhagen. So what would be the motivation for a private investor to get into this type of, of, of markets? And if, if, if it's just for the sake of making money, how um, can we regulate it so we can avoid fraud? When we're talking about a thing, an issue that is, that is really affecting us all, uh, as the humanity itself, how, how can be these markets uh, be transparent and avoid that, that a bunch of, let's say, intermediaries, or I don't know the word in English, uh, can make too much profit out of it. I'll first go, and I think Murray will have a lot to say on this as well. But I just reiterate, you know, regardless of whether you've got an international political declaration or an internationally legally binding agreement, you know, whether the, the drivers for investment are there come down to whether that is then implemented in domestic law. And, and I think you know, one of the key points is what momentum do we see out of the Copenhagen Declaration? Now, first signs, I think there are some glimmers of hope in terms of, I think, the new sort of uh, basic group of countries met in Delhi um, recently last week or the week before, and they weren't, it doesn't, didn't seem to be backsliding in terms of what they were saying they were going to do and the policies and measures they were putting forward. And hopefully from some of the slides that I put down, you can see that there's a lot going on in, on the ground. And don't forget, in terms of meeting these targets, these commitments, the emissions reductions, you know, carbon markets is one of the tools in the policy and regulatory toolbox. I think a really important one, in my view, one of the most economically efficient ones, but it sits there in a, in a range of other tools. And one of the other things I think we will certainly see, which I think will be more vibrant over the next 12 to 24 months, will be the sort of incentive regimes around uh, renewable energy and clean technology. Um, you know, we have those across Europe. There's a very powerful and very successful regime in Spain, uh, in Germany, um, and so on, in terms of feed-in tariffs, and in the UK, in terms of renewable obligation certificates and, and renewable energy certificates in the US and Australia. So you know, we will see a lot of investment in that clean tech and, and, and the renewables area. So that's part of the bigger picture. But ultimately, I mean, I think the carbon markets, whether it's, it's this global harmonized market or the sort of more disparate... Uh, patchwork of markets, which I think is more like, I agree with Murray, is more likely, that still puts a, ultimately, that still puts a price on carbon and gives you transparency. So the question then is how robust is the regulation and the policy around that to ensure that, you know, that actually represents and each credit, whether it's in cap and trade or whether it's, you know, baseline and credit, i.e. the project approach, do those credits really represent real um, emissions reductions? And I guess that comes down to, 
how robust that policy and regulation is, how transparent it is, you know, the, the third party verification, and that's what we get. And that's inherent in the CDM system, and that's why the UN oversees it. And certainly many of the in the market think the system's too um, strict and too onerous, and they feel that many projects that are additional don't get through. You know, that's always going to be the tension and the debate. And that tension and debate is probably a good thing um, in terms of the environmental integrity. Um, and as uh, the point I made, it's very transparent, and that's why you get lots of newspaper articles. And I think that that's always that pendulum is always going to swing backwards and forwards. But that's probably in the longer term um, a good thing because I think it is so transparent. Um, I think it will be in, in practice difficult um, to create systems that are totally open to abuse and fraud. There'll always be some, and I, I think I'd finish on this point that. Uh, you could design a system, you'll never get a system that's 100% um, perfect in terms of how strict it is and how the, what the environmental integrity is, um, but you could design a system that gets pretty close, whether it's an international offset system or, or cap and trade system. The risk is, though, it will be so bureaucratic and so strict that you may get 10, you may get 100 near-perfect projects that everyone feels good about, but they will not deliver anywhere near the magnitude of emissions reductions you need. So there will be a regulatory balance. And you see this in, in the financial sector, and that probably, you know, as we saw, the pendulum was too far the other way, and it's swinging back. But, but ultimately, you have to find where, where's the optimal balance, where you get a system that is efficient, and you get hundreds and hundreds of projects through. So you're getting tens of thousands, millions, um, you know, gigatons of reductions. But you know that you're going to have to accept that 5 7% of the projects that get through will be less than desirable. But you know the vast majority of projects are good projects achieving real emissions reductions. And overall, you, know, you are achieving many, many more gigatons um, of reductions um, because you've got a system at scale. But the price you pay is you'll have a small number of, of bad projects. Alternatively, you say, no, we cannot have any bad projects, so we'll have a perfect system but then you get, you get um, you know, maybe 100 projects if you're lucky, and you get a few million tons of reductions, and that's it. Well, then that's actually the worst case for the environment. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add, because I think the, one of the fundamentals of carbon markets is that there's always a requirement for measurement. Um, and that, that's not true of other policies necessarily. So, in fact, you know, carbon markets require much more measurement <laughs> than many other policies, you know, for it to happen. It's because there is the potential, and there are buyers and sellers, and people don't want to get ripped off. So, so I think carbon markets inherently lead you towards more measurement, um, and, and that's, a, that's a plus. And then the other key issue, and, and Anthony's touched exactly on this, is transparency. That if you have proper transparency and proper sort of systems for, for measurement, then it's much more obvious if you're going to have fraud. And so... You know, and, and there will always be whistleblowers. And so to some extent you can use kind of the strength of just you know, the market in the sense of, of, of whistleblowers um, and you know, people saying that was a bad deal and, and it's immediately around the web. And, you know. So in a very transparent society, if you've also then had good measurement, you've used good measurement methodologies and good you know, information disclosure, I think that you get a lot of that you know, is going to get corrected. And I completely agree that if you... If you have rules that just go to that nth degree of perfection. You know, in fact, that's that's not revolutionary at all. That's going to kill things from moving forward. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that the concern about about fraud uh, is one that is there in all markets. You know, why you know, carbon's no different than anything else. I mean, you can go and buy an orange tomorrow and find it's rotten. You know, at, at your local food market. So, there's always those issues. You've just got to you know find ways to sort of address it. So thank you very much, both Maroi and, and Anthony. Uh, it has been a great pleasure to have you with us today. Thanks for coming from London or around the world where you were. I don't know where, because you're traveling all the time. Uh, I will switch into Spanish again. Eh, gracias a todos por esta primera parte. Vamos ahora una, a la cafetería, la pausa del café. No vamos muy bien de tiempo, así que os diría que 20 minutillos nos cogemos. Gracias. Thank you.